Hello, everybody. This is Gino, and I am the host of the 100-Year Real Estate Investor Show, the show dedicated to personal financial engineering. Today's guest is Rick Sapio, a lifelong entrepreneur who started his first company when he was 13 years old after the untimely death of his father. Since then, he has founded more than 20 companies. Since 94, Rick has been the founder and CEO of an investment holding company, Mutual Capital Alliance, Inc., which has made more than 120 investments. After COVID started, Rick partnered with Jake and Gino on the 100-Year Real Estate Investor to bring long-term legacy investing to the real estate industry. He is the founding and seven-time chair of the Gathering of Titans program, an annual event held at MIT in Boston. Welcome back to the show, Mr. Rick Sapio. Hey, Gino. Great to be here. Uh, rounding out 2021, and uh, it's been a phenomenal year for a lot of people in real estate. Let's hope that keeps going. Mm -hmm. So we're on the show talking about the barbell strategy. And I've got to say, before we start, I intuitively knew that I need to have a lot of money in my safe bucket. And I'll share a quick story with you. In March of 2020, let's go back, everybody. What happened in March of 2020? The world was ending. We didn't know what we were doing. Grant Cardone is cutting half of his staff. Everyone's going crazy. Jake and Gino sitting on that Q1 priority meeting. I remember sitting there, our coaches telling us the world's ending. And we looked at each other. And we said, we've got plenty of reserves in the bank. We've got cash. We've got CapEx accounts. I have my whole life policies. I've got plenty of money. And I knew Rick back then because he had spoken to MM3, but I really didn't understand the barbell strategy. So for those of you out there that want safety, that don't want to chase yield with every dollar that you have, this is an important call for you. I wish I had known this 25 years ago because I would have started sooner and had that money set aside to chase those opportunities. So Rick, let's dive into the barbell strategy. How has it been so important in your investing career? Yeah, it's funny. I've been talking about this for almost 30 years and mm. the barbell strategy is represented by, uh, if you could imagine a strongman barbell, you've got weights on each side mm -hmm. and you've got a thin bar in the middle. And most people put their investments into the bar and make that the heavy bucket. And I'll explain what it is so you know what I mean. We advocate strongly that half of your investments outside of your 401k and your IRA and th those type of accounts, mm -hmm. the extra money. So let's assume that you have a million dollars, 400,000 is going to be on one side of the barbell, 400,000 is going to be on the other side of the barbell, and 20% is in the middle. Mm -hmm. And the middle is represented by those accounts that you should take advantage of, 401k, IRA, Roth IRAs, et cetera. But on the, the sides, what does the world tell you to do? Invest in the stock market, buy mm -hmm. Bitcoin, do this, do that. And what we say you should do and this is based on a lot of research. We, in fact, filed for a patent on the barbell investment strategy. Put half your money in long-term oriented, highly illiquid investments like real estate, like private equity, like land, things that are going to build value over time, but you can't sell. See, the human inclination to sell, 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 that's what eats our returns. Mm -hmm. And on the other side is your safe bucket. That's municipal bonds, that's whole life insurance, that's cash. Mm -hmm. And what happens is this side, because you're going to invest in areas that you know, that's going to perform incredibly well over the long term, as illiquid investments often do. And this is going to be your safe bucket. It should perform three or four percent a year. And when you combine those two, you come out with a nice, healthy, low double digit return. And this is over time. Now, there was a study that was done that's phenomenal. It's called the Yale Endowment Study. And the Yale Endowment was the best performing large pool of asset. And I think it's up to like $50 billion. I don't know. But when you look at its uh, holdings, very little of this massive pool of assets is in stocks and bonds. Very little. I can't remember the numbers. I think it's about 15%. The rest is in things like timberland and land and farms and real estate, highly illiquid long-term investors. So the barbell strategy is completely counterintuitive. Nobody does it. Everybody ignores the ends and puts all their money into Wall Street. And I think that's that's not going to get you the generational wealth. Let's dive in real quick to the psychology. Why is it you think that people want that short-term transactional hit and, and they don't look for that long-termism? Are we taught that? Is it sexy? Is it in our DNA to do that? 
I think a lot of it has to do with what I'm about to tell you. And by the way, my family's watching now. My family discovered my videos online. I just want to say hi to everybody. And uh, it's very rare. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're never a prophet in your own backyard. That's why <laughs> Jesus had to go elsewhere. But it's very, very simple. Here's the bottom line. When commissions were deregulated in 1976, and Charles Schwab was the first discount broker, their message was very simple. You can do this. You know how to buy and sell and trade. You could do it on your own. We're going to facilitate anything you want to do. And now, you know, 40 years later, plus, it's free trading. So it doesn't cost you anything to trade. But when you look at the Dow Bar statistics, Dow Bar is owned by Thompson out of Canada. It's a massive research company that researches investment trading behavior. And what Dow Bar has said over the last 50 years is investors are horrible at investing. Only a very tiny percentage of them actually beat the market. And you guys can Google this yourself. Go Google this story because it's hard to believe. And even when people have the data, they don't care. I'm not going to give you another data point. So the bottom line to answer your question is when people have the ability to trade, they're going to trade mm -hmm. and they're going to lose. So here's what I was going to say. Peter Lynch ran Magellan, Fidelity's flagship fund for 13 years from 1977 to 1990, 13 years. Mm -hmm. The average annual return of that fund while he managed it. Take a guess. I read both of his books. That's the funny thing. I don't remember it. I've, I don't, I, 10%? 29%. Wow. So if you bought it when he started and you sold it when he started, you would have gotten 29% cumulative, mm -hmm. which is something like 30 times on your money. I don't know what the math is. Take a guess. Fidelity's internal study on what the average Fidelity investor made per year oh, on know. that same fund. How much? 2%. <laughs> 2? 2? 2%. Look it up. Everybody just go Google it. Here's why. Because people go, honey, let's buy the Magellan fund. And they would wait till the market was at a high. And then they would put yeah. their retirement account in it. And then when the market went down, oh, we can't own that. It just went down. So they're buying high and they're selling low yes. instead of buying low and selling high. That's the answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Human beings do not have the ability in general to buy low and sell high. It's not in our DNA. That's a great answer. It's, it's a contrarian. I mean, who wants to buy low when everything's you know on fire and people are running for the exits? That's what we tend to do. We tend to follow the crowd. So your strategy of buying things that are liquid, like Jake and myself, we're buying multifamily and we're holding them for the long term. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a perfect example. Our second property we bought, there were one bedroom units. We bought it in 2013, Rick. Rents were $350 for one bedroom. 2021, we're rounding it out. They're 995 plus rubs. So they've tripled in value. Everyone was telling us, oh, you should sell the property and go up. And why would we sell the property? We've, we've tripled the revenue on that. The expenses are basically the same. So on that one stupid little asset, you can create more wealth than trying to continue to turn it over because people are in love with this velocity. If I'm going to buy that and sell that asset right now, I'm buying something that just, just is higher. So why am I trading if I've got a good asset right now? So the inclination to hold it long term may not be natural, but I'm going to tell you that is how you create wealth by buying these assets and running them properly and maintaining that cash flow. How have you utilized the barbell strategy in your in your investing? That's a great question. So I have a lot of uh, whole life insurance, a lot. Uh, in fact, my side of the barbell here is actually a little bit more than 50%. We've got 11 policies. Mm -hmm. And that uh, is money that can't be touched. It can't be touched through bankruptcy or lawsuits or, you know, all kinds of uh, things that people go through. And people that are against uh, whole life insurance as an investment vehicle don't understand that fact. Mm -hmm. You can also borrow against it. So when the next crash happens, if you've got 500,000 sitting here, mm -hmm. keep the 500 in insurance, but borrow it to go buy low. Mm -hmm. And it's just so counterintuitive. I'm reading right now uh, the latest Ray Dalio book about the rise and fall of countries. And it's incredible. It's like clockwork, how countries rise, 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 and then they fall. And it's, it's incredible. He says, you know, it's really quite simple. When you see crashes, you invest. If you invested in the last 10 crashes in the United States, you would have uh, been four times higher investment results than the market. Mm -hmm. But people do the exact opposite. They invest now at the high. We got to mm -hmm. buy Bitcoin at 60,000. And it's unbelievable. So because I know that I can't counter my own 
nature, my human nature that God gave me. I put half my money in cash and half my money in long-term oriented, highly illiquid investments. Mm -hmm. Some of our private holdings we haven't sold for 25 years. And what that means is I can't get my hands on it to go trade it. So uh, that's how I've done it. Whole life insurance policy on the one side, on the other side, private equity. And in the middle, I maximize my uh, investments in the 401k because you get matching there. And I maximize my Roth IRA. And, and that's how I do it. And by the, uh, well, by the way, Gino, everybody's insanely busy in life. Mm -hmm. The barbell strategy, not only does it outperform, right? You, you could look at the Dalbar studies yourself, but it's easy. It's simple. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to, you know, I'm at lunch with my buddy yesterday. I go, what are you doing? You keep looking at your phone. He's like, I'm looking at, I'm looking at my, my stocks. It's like having Vegas in your hand and it's not mm -hmm. helping anybody. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not really investing to me that that's more speculating. That's the thing people have to, they have to decipher between the two. And if you're not a professional trader where you're on there all the time, you're wasting your time. And, and people think about months, you need to think in like Rick, or I, I've been discussing in years and in decades. And even think it through the lens of the hundred year, and you need to have that money on the side, which is your safety net, because stuff will hit the fan. It, it, it's it's the market cycle. It's going to happen again. Don't be caught unprepared because that's when you have the opportunity. If you can buy something at forty or fifty cents on the dollar, you take it out of that bucket, put it into the liquid asset, and you continue to do that. Rick, let's just talk really quick. Um, you know, I love when you talk about values, the values based decision making before we close the show, how can you, you know, align yourself with this kind of thinking, because some people may still say to themselves, you know, the barbell burst strategy, it sounds really good. But how do I really lock myself into doing this? Because for me, once you, you presented to me the values based decision making, and I really got clear on values. Well, my values are I want to leave the generational wealth, I want to leave the generational skills. How do I do that? Well, well, by utilizing whole life insurance, by buying real estate, by setting up trusts, by, by doing all of these things we're doing, but I needed to be aligned with my values. And really, I knew what my values were intuitively, but I just did not know them as clearly yeah. as I should have. Well, let me ask two questions. So the first one is uh, www.100yearrei.com. And it's 100yearrei.com. And that's real estate investor. That's what the mm -hmm. REI stands for. You go there, get set up with somebody, just get on the phone with them. They're not going to bite you. They'll walk you through. Mm -hmm. uh, our agents have done, I think, $2 billion worth of this product. So uh, very highly regarded and highly uh, integral type people. So mm -hmm. that's number one. Um, number two, as it relates to values, I took a lot of time to think about why am I here? What's my mm -hmm. purpose, which is to inspire entrepreneurship and what are my values? And the values are those set of decision-making criteria that resonate with your DNA. And for me, simplicity, probability, leverage, family, health, things like that. Mm -hmm. But by and large, and all of us, I've never run into a person yet who doesn't have a purpose. Okay, we all have one. Sometimes we don't want to admit it because it's a kind of a peel in the onion thing. Yes. And doesn't have a primary value. I sat down with my kids individually, and I, I may have talked about this in the past, but I sat down with my son, Luke, who just turned 14. And I said, Luke, what is your primary value? And he said, that's easy. Like he knows already because it's intuitive. It's perseverance. And I said, why is it perseverance? He said, because look, it took me nine years to get my black belt in karate. It took me six years to become a chess expert. It took me seven years to learn how to play Mozart and Beethoven on the piano. He perseveres. And most kids today, they go from, you know, app to app to app to app to app. And they're crazy busy. And they start drinking at 15. And, they're, you know, they're just kids of the world. And he knows at 14 that his primary value is perseverance. So now I'm working with him on the rest of his values. For me, my number one value is simplicity. I know that. And the barbell strategy fits perfectly in that because it's simple. Now, I don't agree. If you're watching this video, I don't think that anybody would say that their primary value is chaos. Then why the hell do you have a chaotic life? Why do you walk around that screen in your hand 24 seven? Why are you drinking? Why are you taking drugs to control your mental you know, uh, faculties? I am not against all drugs. I am not, and I'm going to get a lot of hate mail for saying that. However, if your primary focus is the opposite of chaos and your secondary focus is your health and well-being, 
I believe your life is going to improve. And there's got to be a financial value in there. Uh, one of my values is to create value, which is what I'm doing here. And I hope my family is appreciating that right now, talking to you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, to answer your question more bluntly and specifically, if you're a human being that has not written down your primary value and your subsequent values that resonate with your DNA, such that you can make decisions that are in complete and total alignment with your God-given DNA, I would say there's something wrong. Like, mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you do that? It might take you an hour. It might take you two hours. It's going to completely transform your life. Mm -hmm. We wrote a book on this called Who's in Your Room and became a number one international bestseller And because it, it resonates. But I will tell you, Gino, very few people will do the work because we're all a addicted to Netflix and video games and news. God, news, news is such bullshit. Mm -hmm. It's like ridiculous. All it is is infotainment and we read it as if it's true. Mm -hmm. I, Rick, I would end the show by saying this quote and I read it in Uriel. We had a recording with Uriel and I love it. It's our perception of who we are changes what we do. How do you perceive yourself? If you perceive yourself as someone who's chaotic, you're going to do things that are chaotic. If you perceive yourself as somebody who wants to go towards that integrity, towards having the simplicity in your life, you perceive yourself like that. I mean, I, I perceive myself as a multifamily investor eight years ago. And guess what? I've become a multifamily investor. Now I'm perceiving myself as an opera singer. So what am I doing? I'm going out and taking opera lessons and, and other things. I want to be a healthy person. So I am a runner. I've been running for the last six months. You need to change your perception of who you are. And simplicity in life sometimes is great because you can get rid of the chaos. And especially in investing, focus on it. Don't have that shiny object syndrome. I love the, the cash side of the bucket where it's really safe. And then I like the side where you take risk, where you become an expert at it. And that's what Jake and I have been doing. We've weathered the pandemic through 2020. We've come out with flying colors. Now we're actually underwriting and closing deals in the last six weeks because we have the capital there. It's there to move it from one side to the liquid side. And that liquid side pays every month. That's where the cash flow, that's where our lifestyle goes. And you keep putting from one side to the other side. So I love it. Any final words, Rick? Yeah, I would say not to go negative here, but I think it's worth people just trying to wake up and realize what's uh, the dominant thought in their life. I would say the primary number one value for most Americans today, as we think about the last two years, is victimhood. Mm -hmm. I am a victim. I love being a victim. All my friends are victims. On social media, I find more victims. Uh, could you imagine what that person said three years ago about me? Oh, my mm -hmm. God. And mm -hmm. we just become victims. And it's sad when we could become, you know, generators and producers and creators and make things happen and mm -hmm. put money in the bank and enrich the world and, you know, uh, live a life aligned with our purpose and our purpose typically, everyone's purpose typically is something that makes the world better. Mm -hmm. My purpose is to inspire entrepreneurship. Your purpose is to teach and help people grow. And when you find your purpose and you find your values, the victimhood goes away, it vanishes, it doesn't exist anymore. And one thing, final thing for you, just watching you, I mean, you've got six kids, you've got a real estate company, you've got a learning development company, you're singing opera, you're writing books, just came out with a kid's book, which my kids love. You are a producer, you make things happen. And what I've learned is you are either making things happen or you are taking, makers and takers. Mm -hmm. And my goal in saying this is to get those victims on the take side to go, wow, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a maker now, I'm a producer. I wanna be just like Gino. Why the hell am I doing all this crap following someone else's lead, watching news, spreading gossip, whatever the hell you're doing, mm -hmm. become a producer. So I love that. That's so well said. And, and to everybody, I think the theme of the show, honestly, without the barbell strategy, and this show is dedicated to Morgan, by the way, the barbell <laughs> strategy is great. That's what the theme of the show was. But it really comes down to responsibility. If you become responsibility for everything, just start out small, write down your values. If you don't have them, become responsible for that. And you take those little steps every day, you become responsible for those little actions. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, you have six kids, you're writing books, you have three or four different companies, you're aligned with people, the proximity, it doesn't happen overnight. It is a long-term endeavor. But once you decide to become responsible, it's a lot of work because all of a sudden you can't blame anybody else. Everything that happens in your life is, 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 is your fault. You know, T. Harbecker says it great. Your fruits are in your roots. 
man, how are you, how are your roots doing? If you see nice oranges off that tree, guess what you're doing? Well, I saw a lot of bare fruit at one point in my life. Couldn't blame anybody else, but the roots that I had planted. So go out there and think about that. That's really, really powerful. You were a living, breathing example of someone that went from victimhood taking yep. to producer or maker. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a great book, by the way, that was written in 1997 called Makers and Takers. I love it. Uh, so anyway, Gino, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas Are we to allowed to say that? I know that's illegal in some parts of the Merry world. Merry <laughs> Christmas. Happy New Year. Um, it's been a great year, actually. I mean, it's been, it's been wonderful. We've, we've created a great relationship here. I love working with you. The ideas that we have. Remember, surround yourself with amazing people. It's still about the proximity. And it's about creating impact. That's what we're all about. Entrepreneurs, are, we're not about chasing money. Ultimately, we're about chasing opportunity. That money will follow once, you've, once you're looking at the opportunity. So just start changing your, you need to tweak a few little things in life, everybody. That's all you need to do. Start becoming responsible. 100yearrei.com. Go visit the website and we will see you on the next show. Thanks, Rick.